so regarding the equalization grant, you're spot on, and I think um, Representative Lindsay was spot on. And um, it's not just that Gwinnett is a receiver, they're the largest Well, I think, you know, it's funny, because I've had discussions with other um, uh, receiver counties, and they want to reform, because they think it's very awkward uh, and inappropriate that Gwinnett is receive so much of it. We could, I mean, there are really poor school districts around our state that could use that infusion, and they really need it. So there is reform that needs to go on there. There is no doubt about that, and I certainly support that. And in looking at that, we need a comprehensive look at funding, because we fund based on 19 different student categories that fit into six periods of a day, on one day that we count, or two days that we live. You know, and that's just really not, um, it's, it's administratively uh, complicated. It's uh, cost, it's not, it costs a lot to, to maximize your funding there, and it's really almost unauditable. So if you had fraud going on there, it's very difficult to detect. So I'm, I'm, I go with what Milton Friedman said, you want a system where all the wrong people have to make all the right decisions, and that's not it. And um, it's also, it, it ties the hands, or it, it, you get a lot of hand wringing going on um, with uh, every time you have a, a Representative Lindsay or a Senator Hill or anyone that wants to do a parent trigger or wants to do a charter school or anything because what happens is they say, oh, well, we can't, I mean, the funding form is so complicated. We can't, you know, we don't know what each pupil, well, you know what? Then let's simplify that. Let's attach the funding to the child and then we'll make it real easy for your math calculation and then we'll know exactly. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm talking about how we fund the traditional, how we fund the public. We don't need 19 categories in six different periods of the day. Each child needs to have a base amount, and then depending on the services they receive, a marginal increase uh, depending if they're a special needs child or a gifted child, that kind of thing. And then you have a very clear cut funding formula. It's attached to the child. And so whether you're funding a traditional public school or whether you're funding a traditional public, or excuse me, a charter public school, you know exactly what should be flowing into that school, and you can more clearly identify the inefficiencies of central offices, of programs and initiatives that end up costing and not helping that teacher. I often say, more classroom, less bureaucracy. So that's what we need, and a funding formula is, uh, and, and simplifying it is a really important step in that direction. And, and simplifying the um, equalization grant so that the poorer counties uh, really uh, they do better under it, and we don't uh, send so much to wealth, wealthier counties. So. One other thing, yes. Anyone else? Keep in mind. Schools still need to take care of it. 90% of our children. Yes, One thing we need to be doing is putting teeth in what we tried to do several years ago, which was mandate that more money go into the classroom yep. rather than into the bureaucracy. Yes. We came up with a formula. Unfortunately, uh, our present school board superintendent has has year in and year out grant waivers uh, to the school districts in terms of the percentage of dollars which should be going into the classroom. Uh, so it's not just a matter of the amount of money that's allocated, it's a matter of making sure the money's actually going to be your children in the classroom rather than going to the bureaucracy. It's called a 65% rule. And unfortunately, it's been followed in its exception rather than uh, being actually being uh, demanded upon by the uh, school district. But one thing we desperately need uh, is to have uh, folks at the top of the state school board uh, and the school school superintendent to be actually enforcing that law rather than year in, year out, right, 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 right. Absolutely. Well, absolutely, and I think that goes to the point of uh, who's doing the people's business, uh, who, who represents kids and taxpayers. Uh, and so that, that's a very important point. And, I often say that what they do, um, not only do they get waivers, they play what I call budget bucket bingo because they have all these different categories and that they can classify uh, different salaries under. And there's, I forget that, maybe it's nine categories. You know, oh, well, we don't want to go over that. Well, that'll make our central office look too big. We'll put it in this bucket and nobody will see. And we've seen that play out. In fact, in DeKalb County, for instance, I took a history from fiscal year 08 through uh, the present time I had, when I did this last year. And when I looked, they would they would tell you, we cut 300 central office staff. We did this, we did that. Well, I could never get a reconciliation of that, which was really interesting. But what I could do is, you know, the money, follow the money, right? So I looked, and in every single salary category that I looked at, there had been a real cut. You had a 25% cut to instructional salaries. That's teachers. That's less classroom. But strangely enough, there was one category that grew over this eight-year period of time. 
You're shaking your head. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was general administration. The general administration salaries had grown 14, almost 14 and a half percent. But yet we were told, board members like myself were told, oh, we cut 300 positions from central office. Oh, it's slash and burn. Nobody's here to answer the phones. That's why you don't get good service. Well, that's bizarre because every other salary category had between 20 and 25 percent cuts over time. Central office had 14 and a half percent growth. So there's, um, you cannot uh, simultaneously hold the belief that you've cut central office staff, yet when I look at the reconciliation of the numbers, there's been a 14 and a half percent increase. Those two things are just not congruent. That's intellectual dishonesty there. So, so that uh, they can say that all they want, but the numbers tell you a very different story. That's the kind of thing, we, you know, you have to ask yourself, how did the state let that happen? How does the state let that kind of budgeting go forward? Okay, so we need to put a stop to that. Um, and the state has a big... Um, part to do with that. And we have to get some of our other speakers and I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Real, real quick, um, to tie into that. We see over and over again uh, districts who are adjusted in their audits by tens of millions of dollars. Buford, they were mine and hollered even though they had their debt when they were called out on it. Cherokee, DeKalb, you know, this is how they hide their money. Yes, yes. Is the budgeting process broken to the point in yes. the school districts yes. across yes. the state that it requires legislation? And has the state school board failed miserably at, at maintaining financial control? You know, I don't know how honest um, the financial information is going to the school boards, the state school board. And that's probably true for a, a lot of the school boards. I mean, and then of course you've got the, um, you know, you, you've got board members that are pinned in, they are elected representatives of the people, but then they're told, you know, don't be discordant, don't be suspicious of uh, an administration and so on. And so they're fearful to ask questions, fearful to reconcile, point out things, that kind of stuff. So that's a real problem. Budgeting needs to be reformed. Um, I talk about that often. I think the state has um, an area where they need to improve the disclosure. They need to be making a call on the budgets because there are a lot of deceptive techniques that go on to get to, Representative Lindsay was talking about a zero budget. Well, boards, you know, the school systems have to have that too, but what happens is, and what I uncovered in the cab was $54 million of accumulated cash reserves of a district were just blown out the door by Net, you know, by this poor budgeting. What happened was they would say, oh, well, electricity, we're going to budget for uh, $10 million. But they knew for the last decade they spent between 15 and $16 million every single year. It was very, very consistent. I would ask about this, and I was told what was hot. I was told it was cold. I was told rates went up. Well, that's kind of funny because for 10 years it's been 15 to $16 million. So that's that's not rates and hot weather or cold. That's none of that. So why did you budget 10? They would stonewall and never answer the question. So there's, we know why they did it, to get to a zero balanced budget, because that meant, oh, we don't have to cut jobs over here in some area where they should have actually been cutting some program, some initiative, some sweetheart deal they were giving away. So we were using Enron style accounting right there. You know, that is bad. We cannot do that. And your school, your, your state board, uh, your state department of education should make disclosures to the public about what they, um, and, ha and formulate an opinion about budgets, not just audits. Audits are very different than making a disclosure about the veracity of a budget, okay? There's two different things. And too often, they don't go back and uh, you, you have to file a form at the end of the year with a financial statement with all of your modified accruals built in and you send that to the state. And then two years later, you're into another budget cycle, you get that audit. Well, a lot of good that does you even if there are findings. But, you, but making um, a disclosure about the budget and making a judgment about the veracity of that budget would be a very helpful tool. And our Department of Education needs to do that rather than going, oh, well, we're going to look at our shoes and hope for the best. So we really have to reconcile the spending to the budget because that is why you're seeing deficit spending, these unrealistic assumptions put in budget. So um, there's a lot of work the state can do. Uh, but you've got to have honest data and honest people um, you know, making that judgment call and telling telling um, taxpayers that. Um, one of the, the biggest concerns I have as an educator and as a parent is the number of school days. I know here in Cobb we're down to 175, which is not bad right. from the 180 that we should. But there are districts in South Georgia that are down to 145 school yes. days. And that is learning, I don't care if it's Common Core or whatever, you can't replace that. No, you can't. You can't replace that. Okay, so she asked about, she had a, very, a big concern about the cutting of school days, especially in some of our poor districts. 
And, and that is, it, it, it seems really just, um, like that's a moral issue too. How can you have some children being able to gain, you know, their 180 day school year and some you're having, you know, over a month less? That's really not fair. Uh, and I think fixing the equalization grant would help solve some of that problem. And DeKalb, uh, you know, and I talked about um, $54 million, well, um, $3 million is a furlough day. I mean, you start to, add, you know, for the cap salaries. So, so you start to add $6 million as a kid in the classroom, okay? These things are, you know, important, and, and they're going to be different numbers for um, a, a poorer district. But, yeah, we need to restore their days. And nobody, like um, Representative Lindsay said, nobody wants to cut education, and it has been cut less than others. Let me give you one other piece of perspective, and then I really have to sit down because... You're not here to, this is a forum for everybody to learn from other people, but, um, so we have the lowest graduation rate uh, when you look at every state that borders us. We have the lowest graduation rate. And every state that borders us spends more per pupil, or excuse me, spends less. Okay, so every state that borders us, higher rate of graduation, and spends less per pupil to get it. Also, Mississippi, um, Texas, and Arkansas have higher graduation rates and spend uh, less per pupil to get that. I'm not advocating that we spend less per pupil. I'm not advocating more austerity cuts. Um, nobody wants to do that. that. That's the investment we all want to make. We all want to invest in our kids. That's, that's what parents do. Um, but we can't accept the outcome of what, of what we are spending and what we're getting because we know that everyone around us is getting a greater return on their investment. So why is that? And how long are we going to be the number one state for business when you can look around and see that this is an economic development issue, okay? And that statistic, it's not the whole story. We have some great statistics. We have some great superintendents and great school systems doing wonderful work for kids and taxpayers every day. But that's one of those big optics. That's what CEOs look at. That's what, it's published everywhere. People talk about it. So we've got to, I call that the on-ramp into middle class life. We've got to fix that statistic to get kids into a, a, a life where they're part of society, okay? So, and that we're not paying for later, and our children aren't paying for later. So, with that, I'm really, now.